Bobbish. Good afternoon. My name is Pierre Etienne Meunier. I'm sorry I couldn't be here with you today, uh, but I'm still going to tell you about version control, uh, and especially about the project I've been working on for a number of years now called Pihul. And my presentation is named Version Control in the Age of Distributed Computing because I, I like to see version control as a distributed system. Why? Well, well, because uh, it's, a, it's a system where one or more co-authors are adding a shared data structure. Often uh, we like to see the, the, that data structure just as a file, but it's actually more general than that, as we will see in this presentation. These authors, they, they uh, apply changes, sometimes also called patches, to common shared version. One major pain point and topic and field of study in uh, version control is conflicts. So we don't always agree on what we want to write in, in files. And when that happens, we say there is a conflict and we need a tool to uh, inform us that there is a conflict and help us resolve the conflict. Another important feature of version control is the ability to review and change a project's history. So for example, tell who introduce, introduced which uh, bug or, or feature sometimes at which point in time and what was there before and how, uh, how, that, how things happened in the project his, project's history. In this presentation in general, I want to adopt uh, what I call the fundamental point of view. Fundamental is very different from important or useful. Actually, you can have very fundamental questions that are completely unimportant and useless. But what I mean by fundamental here is uh, questions that are at the basis of, uh, of things. So, so foundational or root questions. What is version control? How do we characterize it in terms of distributed system? What mathematical theorems are relevant uh, to it? That, that, kind, that kind of questions. But still, uh, at the end of this presentation, I also talk about uh, actual down-to-earth implementation of uh, issues. All right, so just a few more words about conflicts. I want to insist on the fact that there is no universally agreed definition of conflicts. Uh, first, they are where we need a good tool the most, because we need a, a tool that allows us to see exactly where, um, where we disagree and where we're conflicting, and not just a tool that just will invent conflicts, for example, or that will uh, be less, let's say, fine-grained about, uh, about the essence of conflicts. The exact definition is not uh, widely widely agreed and, and depends on uh, what we want. For example, well, one very basic and very common case of a conflict is when Alice and Bob write at the same place in the same file. So we can't decide on the contents of, of their lines after we, applied, we apply all their changes. Uh, well, in that case, it's obviously uh, a conflict. That example is, is relatively simple. Another example when, is when we have uh, a file F and Alice renames it to G while Bob at the same time renames it to H. What should the file be called after we applied both changes? Well, we don't know. There is no an ambiguous way to tell. And so that this is also something we want to call a conflict. Yet another example, maybe a bit more subtle, as, a, as a, the, the example of a global conflict. So we have a function F Alice renames it to, let's say, to G, and Bob at the same time, maybe in another file, maybe in another library, adds the call to F. That's also a conflict where, but it's, it's, a, it's a trickier one because it's a conflict where one change in a file has global consequences. This depends on the language, this depends on a, vari a variety of, of factors. And actually, not all tools handle these, these uh, sorts of conflicts. And actually, Pihul doesn't even uh, know about, about these. But I still include the example just to show that conflicts are uh, really broad in, in definition, and we can't really agree. Uh, we are even conflicting on the definition of, of conflicts, if I may say. All right. Before we start, in order to make this talk uh, as self-contained as possible, I, uh, let me give you some minimal bibliography that won't be long, I promise. First, in distributed system, a very important theorem, in my opinion, is the CAT theorem introduced by Brewer in 1998. The CAT theorem states that the system robust to network partitions, and we all want our systems to be robust to network partitions. We certainly don't want our systems, our, our, uh, our uh, 
products or services to go down and completely crash when the internet goes down or when a data center uh, catches fire, for example. That happens sometimes, as we will see in the rest of this presentation. So a system robust to network partitions, i.e. all systems, cannot be consistent and available at the same time. Here, consistent means that if you have multiple servers in your network and uh, you send the same request to your different servers, they will answer the same thing at the same time. So all servers see the same states of the system. So obviously we all want our, our systems to be consistent. Uh, imagine, for example, you're writing an e-commerce website and the, the, the customer's uh, cart is handled by different servers uh, for scheduling reasons. Well, certainly we don't want the customer to see a, a different cart, to see, to see their cart change for no, uh, no explainable reason. So consistency is really something we want. Availability is also something we uh, deeply uh, desire. Availability is the fact that your, your, your um, server's answer cannot be arbitrarily delayed by an adversary. And certainly we all want our, our servers to be uh, available because we want them to uh, respond fast. We want as little latency as possible. But unfortunately, the CAT theorem states that you cannot have both at the same time. So this naturally yields two classes of systems, one, the ones that choose consistency. For example, they might do that by uh, running leader elections and, and uh, running all their changes through a single leader, just one particular server. Uh, the the, the uh, widest class of algorithms to do uh, leader election is called Paxos. It was introduced by Lampert in 1989. And it was simplified to a really e easily understandable protocol called RAF by Ongaro and Oosterhaus in 2011. The other class of systems clearly is the class of uh, systems that choose availability over consistency. The first prototype of that was operational transforms introduced by Ellis and Gibbs in 1989. Operational transforms is when you uh, your way to handle concurrent changes is to first apply the first change that came and then uh, still from a central server, right? And then uh, modify the second, the second change according, accordingly. And all the, um, all, the, uh, all the difficulty in, implementation, in, in, in the implementation of operational transforms lies in this accordingly. Most algorithms are described in academic papers that are often a bit light on details. And all engineers who've worked on um, operational transforms will tell you that they're not easy to implement. They're hard to reason about, they're hard to prove. And the more complicated the underlying data structure, the underlying states, the harder it is to, uh, to, to, to write correct operational transform algorithms. Another class of system is uh, conflict-free replicated data types. They are a more recent class of algorithms introduced by Shapiro et al. in 2011. And in CRDTs, you design the data structures and the operations at the same time in such a way that all the operations are commutative and associative. So two uh, nice algebraic properties we'll talk a bit more in a minute. So th this means that the order in which you apply the edits doesn't matter. And this is great because you don't have to do uh, anything special. You can prove your, uh, if you define your operations properly, you can prove that they work, they work well together. You can swap the order without any consequence. And, uh, and that's great because then you just have to implement it and it just all works. The downside is that we have relatively fewer uh, existing conflict-free conflict replicated data types, and they are a bit, a bit. They take a bit longer to design than just uh, operational transform. Operational transforms, for example, you might just uh, invent a document data structure, and then when a new change, when you in, when you want to design a new change, you can just add it to the system, and this makes things extremely complicated because you have to check that it works well with all the others. But uh, you can do things incrementally, whereas CRDTs are a bit more like a, 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 full, uh, a full scheme at once. Okay, so how does this relate to uh, version control? 
Well, because uh, the main desirable properties we want out of uh, changes are the following, actually the ones I want. The first one is associativity. Associativity means that uh, changes can be applied one by one or together without changing the results. So this means that you can, for example, uh, pull your changes one by one, carefully review them, and then apply them to your production branch, for example. So in mathematical terms, this means that A, B together, and then, so that this is the case where you've reviewed and applied B. So A, B followed by C is the same thing as A followed by B and C taken together. So this is a highly desirable property. It seems really obvious uh, that all version control systems have it, but unfortunately none of them does, uh, except Pirot. Commutativity. Uh, is a is a nice property as well. We do want it. It's the fact that changes that could be written independently, meaning not necessarily all changes. Um, so changes that could be written independently can be applied in any order without affecting the results. So A, B equal B, A. And while this may seem like a, pro, uh, a, a non-important uh, secondary property. It's, I, I actually want to argue to the contrary that it's possibly the most important thing you want out of, of, of version control. Why? Well, because even if it feels like you're not actually using it, even if you don't have many servers with different orders of, of patches in them, you still want commutativity. Because uh, this gives you infinite flexibility to manipulate your changes. This gives you the ability to uh, talk about older changes that came a few a few changes ago, and maybe uh, unapply them or change the order afterwards. But even changing the order is not super important. What commutativity gives you is uh, the ability to treat each change independently, to cherry pick them, to um, change their context. So even if you don't end up having multiple servers in different uh, orders, commutativity still matters a lot. And in my experience working with commutative version control systems, they save a lot of time. The final property I want out of my changes is I want my changes to be um, un unappliable even after other independent changes have been added. So this means if I've pushed a, a bug to production, and I want to uh, I want to fix it. I can unapply my bug, and then uh, that will give me the time without having to go back to a, a, an older version. I can still get the uh, subsequent features, the subsequent patches, but uh, I want to take take my time to uh, uh, to write a, to write a fix, to write a, a better patch, and then push that patch. The current version control systems are all more or less in some way trying to simulate the, these properties, but I will give you a few examples that uh, they, they, don't, they don't always succeed. So Git, Mercurial, SVN, CVS, they're all very different systems, right? But fundamentally, they all use the same principles to do their, their merges. So we will just consider them as just like one uh, single class of uh, version control systems for the purpose of this presentation. They try to simulate, for example, associativity. Git merge tries hard to do that. But unfortunately, it doesn't work. I'll give you an example just in the next slide. And you'll often hear the, the uh, advice that long-lived branches are, are, are bad practice. So if, if you have a remote and, and you're pulling branch, you're pulling comets one by one, this is, long, this is called long-lived branches, you might end up with uh, lots of unexplained conflicts. And certainly, we don't want that. So uh, I would argue that this, there is no good reason to avoid long-lived branches, except that um, uh, uh, the limitations of the tool. Another command, uh, git cherry pick, and to a lesser extent, git rebase, tries to simulate commutativity. But uh, you'll again hear the advice that you don't want to merge the same branch uh, later on after a cherry pick, or you'll also get some explained conflicts. And I would argue that um, instead of trying to focus on these unexplained conflicts and trying to make conflict handling easier, so just like some tools that are already doing that, git rev, 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 for example, is a, a git command, and jujutsu, a more recent system, 
they they try to do that. They try to say, well, all these conflicts are bad. Let's let's uh, let's try to fix conflicts and let's try to make them less painful to handle. Well, this is great. Like it's it's always good to have a to to have a easier conflicts. But I would argue that um, I, I want to I prefer a different approach. I prefer to focus to focus on the causes of conflicts instead of the conflicts themselves. And I believe that by doing that will be able to also fix the conflicts later on. Like it, it will make everything easier and conflict handling will come naturally as a consequence of um, the a proper mo modeling and uh, definition of conflicts. So um, just to uh, illustrate my earlier points that Git and SBN are failing to be associative. Um, the following example starts with just one file and two two lines A and B. On the top path, Alice adds a G at the beginning of the file, and then she adds a for, uh, another copy of A and B. And then in parallel to that, uh, Bob adds an X, just a single line with X between the the, the uh, initial two lines. Well, when they merge, and you can try that today with Git and SVM, when they merge. Uh, Bob's new line will get merged into Alice's new line. So Bob has worked in the middle of the file or towards the end maybe, and his new lines get merged into the beginning of the file. So it's like a giant uh, line reshuffling. And I don't know about you, but if I were working on a project with uh, high security constraints, for example, that would just terrify me and I couldn't possibly work with such a tool. So how do we do better? Well, it turns out there's a mathematical theory that does just that, that not just that, just a bit more than that. But uh, category theory gives us a, a lot of tools to talk about these, system, these systems and analyze them and uh, find solutions. So the thing we want here really, uh, when we are, when we are uh, starting with a, a, a state X and we have two concurrent patches F and G, we would like a state P to exist and also to be unique or unambiguous, to be sort of the merge of F and G. So what we what that means to be the merge is that for any common state that uh, Alice and Bob could reach, any common state Q that Alice and Bob could reach after F and G respectively, P is minimal in the sense that uh, Q is also accessible from P. So Instead of just working to reach a common state, they could they could first reach the common state and then uh, and then work together. So if P exists and is unique, P is called the pushout of F and G. That's a definition from category theory. That work was started by Samuel Mimram and uh, Cynthia Di Giusto from Ecole Polytechnique, by the way, a few few years ago, of uh, on on basic cases. So. <clears throat> Uh, the problem is that pushouts don't always exist, or otherwise said, sometimes there are conflicts. We we can't uh, merge and ambiguously and and nicely. The question becomes how to generalize the representation of states like x, y, z, so that all pairs of patches we could imagine from x have a pushout. Well, um, category theory, if you if you have an initial modeling of uh, your states as a, a graph of lines, for example, or just like the order of, of lines, a list of lines, let's say, then category theory will tell you that uh, there's a bit of calculations going on there, but you will know that in order to have all the, the pushouts of all, all, uh, all uh, pairs of, of patches, you need your states to actually be directed graphs where vertices are bytes, or in order to make them smaller, or exponentially smaller, byte intervals. And edges between these vertices are the union of all orders known between the vertices. This means that when you have an edge from uh, one byte to another byte, it means the first one comes before uh, the second one, according to at least one author. So they might even conflict and have uh, circular files, for example, if they can't agree on an order between lines. So let me give you not just a concrete example, but a full definition of all the operations that uh, Pihul supports. There are just 
two of them actually, so that, that won't take long, just two slides. Adding the line, this is the first, first operation. Well, first, vertices are labeled by a patch identity, the patch that introduced them. So we'll start with an initial patch C0, which introduced uh, an initial interval of bytes uh, from zero to N within that patch. So you can see here on the left diagram, you have just one single vertex C0, zero, zero N. And um, the, my intervals, by the way, are uh, inclusive on the left-hand side and exclusive on the right. -hand. Edges are labeled by the patch that introduced them. This is not super important for now. You can ignore the information, but uh, it's actually it, it actually helps in uh, understanding the graph. So uh, we'll now we'll just add a, a vertex with m bytes between positions i minus one and i of patch c zero. How do we do that? Well, we'll we start by splitting c zero zero n into uh, two vertices. One is C0, 0, I, ex exclude, I, I excluded, so it's from 0 to I minus 1 included. The other one is C0, I, N. And then between these two vertices, we'll add our new vertex, C1, 0, M, and then two new edges labeled by C1 to mark that we know this new vertex comes uh, before C0, I, N, and after C0, 0, I. All right, so that's that was easy. That's how we add lines in Pihul. Now, how do we delete lines? I, I call them lines here, but they are really actually just uh, bytes or blocks of bytes. So let's write a patch C2, which deletes not just part of a vertex, but uh, it deletes. It will delete a byte interval that spans across two vertices. So it will delete bytes J, to i from c0 and then 0 to k from c1. So we're starting from the uh, middle diagram here, the diagram we were left with at the end of the last slide. We start by again splitting some vertices. Well, because we are deleting from c0, 0, i, we'll split that vertex at position j. So this gives us two vertices, c0, 0, j, and c0, j, i. And then we'll split c1, c1 0 m into two vertices c1 0 k and c1 k m again adding all the all the relevant edges between these vertices to mark the order we know about uh, about the the like between the intervals and the final thing we do in order to delete are two blocks c0 0 uh, j i and c1 0 k is that we replace Ed, uh, full line edges by dashed edges. This means the target of this edge is to be deleted, is dead. All right, that's all. We do nothing more than this in Pirul. So how does this solve conflicts? How does this model conflicts? I'll give you a few examples. But definitions first, I call alive vertices, those vertices whose incoming edges are all alive. Similarly, dead vertices or vertices with incoming edges are all dead. This gives uh, another class of, of uh, vertices, which are vertices with mixed incoming edges, both some, some alive, some dead. And these vertices are called dead, alive, or zombies. And now I say that the graph is conflict-free if and only if it has no zombies and all the live vertices are totally ordered. Then there's a lot of details to uh, show the to show the conflicts to the user because obviously we're only showing uh, files to the user and we're working on graphs. So there's a little mismatch here and the algorithms in order to move from one to the other are not super easy, but I won't get into the details here. So two examples of conflicts. First, the most basic conflict we can imagine, an order conflicts starting with uh, a line with three lines, A, B, and C. We, uh, for, like first Alice will, will introduce a line D between A and B, and Bob will introduce a line E independently between A and B as well. And when they merge, we have two new lines, E and D in the graph, and no order relation, no path between them in any direction. So we don't know which comes first between E and D. And this is how we tell that uh, this is a conflict because the graph is not total order. Another example of conflicts in order to uh, talk a bit about zombies, starting again from the same file, Alice will this time delete 
line C. And Bob uh, independently will add a line D just before C. When they merge, they get uh, the graph in the bottom right corner. And here we, you can see that C has two edges pointing to it, uh, an alive one and a deleted one. This means that C is a zombie. But actually, in real life, for user interface reasons, we don't really want to mark C as a zombie. We want to mark D as a zombie. But that's just an implementation detail. All right, so there, there, there's a few more examples of, of conflicts. I won't get into the details because they are not exactly all the same. But well, I hope you get the idea. Now let's talk about some down-to-earth implementation, as I promised in the beginning of this talk. Pirul is almost entirely written in Rust. It was started in 2014, and I believe the first line of Rust was written in uh, the summer of 2015, uh, just bits after uh, the release of Rust 1.0. It's been in beta since January the 18th, 2022, so a bit over a year now. Its notable components include uh, a, a, a storage backend, Senakiria. Senakiria is a library for uh, implementing transactional on this data structures. And there's one particular data structure central to its uh, internal work called uh, B trees. And uh, the, my B, the B trees in Senakiria have the property that they can be forked in near constant time. Libpirul is uh, a library, a Rust trait, with the algorithm described in this talk and a few more. And Pihul is the common line interface to that library, including as well network operations to uh, send patches to your, to your friends and co-authors. Just a quick zoom in on Sanakiria before we move on. Uh, Sanakiria was, it's, it's just uh, initially was, it was meant to be a library implementing key value, a key value store that would be transactional on disk. There's a few libraries that, exist, that existed as well at the time that do exactly that. But I wanted it to be forkable in near constant time. That's how we implement branches. So those of you familiar with referential transparency and purely functional data structure will immediately know what I'm talking about here. This is not super hard to implement. There's just like one twist that made it really hard that is transactionality. If you work on purely functional data structure, usually you work in memory. And when you unplug the machine, the memory is entirely wiped and you there's no risk of uh, rebooting into a uh, uh, corrupt state. Whereas if you store your data on disk, there's uh, if you unplug the machine, you might end up in a corrupt state. So we want to avoid corrupt state uh, entirely. And this wasn't intentional, but Sanakiria turned out to be the fastest open source library for all supported operations. The benchmark, uh, the benchmark for this was not run by me, it was run by the other of another library. Um, so this wasn't intentional, but it was a nice consequence. It is reusable for other data structures. Fundamentally, Sanakiria is just a memory allocator in a file. So as long as you can split your data structures into uh, uh, blocks of finite size, like B trees can do that, uh, or ropes as well, you can implement all kinds of data structures, not necessarily search trees. Uh, yeah, I've implemented ropes, the alternative to strings, and and a few others. It's also generic in its uh, in its uh, underlying storage, so it can use uh, a memory mapped file. But that's the primary thing. But it can also use more exotic backends like compressed files or serverless constructs, like a Cloudflare KV, for example. The only downside, and it's a big one, it's uh, is that the the it's the, the this extreme generosity makes it really hard to use. There's a a bunch of man, manual memory allocation going on as well, and this isn't super super easy. This comes from the uh, the extreme flexibility that you can in Sanakiria you, you can have your your uh, your uh, keys and values and not necessarily byte strings. They can be like for example the keys can be uh, numbers for example uh, sixty four bit numbers and the values can be well I don't, anything really it can be a string of course but it can also be another key value store or an another uh, data structure, like for example, a rope or uh, or peerhole channel, for example. 
So this makes it uh, not easy to use. And we're, we're definitely uh, calling for contributions here, not necessarily to write any code or documentation, but just bike shedding and discussing the design would be uh, really useful in order to be able to provide a simpler uh, interface in the future. Important implementation details of Pihul. Um, I hope I've managed to convince you uh, with the beginning of this talk that cherry picking, partial clones, even repository merges and splits uh, don't need any special treatments. Here, we just apply patches, unapply patches, and that's all we do. And that's enough to deal with all these, uh, all these cases. This yields a very simple command line interface with very few commands and uh, powerful enough to do everything we want to do. Another uh, consequence and bits of design is that patches are detachable from their contents. So far, I've not told you much about uh, the actual bytes in the patches, and that was intentional. The, um, the vertices in, in our graphs are uh, byte intervals. They're just, they just like two 64-bit numbers. And, and that's it. They don't contain any contents. The contents is included in the patches themselves. So the patches have a contents uh, section, and that section is detachable. So you might download just the operational section with the uh, describing which operations need to be applied to the graph. And, and then later on, you can lazily download the content. So for example, if you're working on large binary files and you have a sequence of patches, maybe at the end of the sequence, some of the vertices are dead, well, you don't have to download their contents. You can just download, uh, in that case, you will just have to download the final version, for example. So again, we don't need any special protocol, any LFS, any, we don't need anything extra. Just the fact that patches are detachable from their contents is enough to handle uh, these uh, giant binary assets. Pihul, as well, I've talked about Sadakiria, but this means that Pihul has, has a generic backend, which can be used on disk in compressed files. Compressed files are how we implement tags. For example, tags in Pihul are full blown uh, Pihul repositories, just read only, but that's the, about the only difference. Uh, serverless databases, I'll talk a bit more about that in a, in a minute. Just uh, this is my, the last topic I want to talk about in this talk. Uh, hosting service, we've started a hosting service called The Nest, uh, nest.pihul.com. It uh, was written entirely in uh, asynchronous Rust. It's the first attempt at uh, providing a hosting service. It was written in asynchronous Rust using Tokyo and Hyper. It's, uh, it's deployed using Nix, running on Nix OS, uh, and a bunch of custom tools to deploy to OVH uh, because OVH uses OpenStack. It's replicated in three data centers, one in Canada, one in France, one in Singapore. This project also motivated the creation of an SSH library to write the server. So for example, uh, this is a, a bit of the design for security. The Nest doesn't actually run an open SSH server. It runs a server which pretends to uh, to be an open SSH server. It talks the SSH, the, the SSH protocol, but it has absolutely no access to the system. It doesn't log users in. It doesn't it doesn't run any commands. What it does is just it uh, looks at your the commands you send it to uh, its pseudo shell. It just matches these commands against the regular expression and calls a uh, function from libpihul based on the results of the match. And then finally, uh, this was fun to write as well because pihul repositories are CRDTs, so they're particularly suitable for replication if you, if you write the, the appropriate tools. This uh, project faced a large number of issues. The, star the starting point of the... Uh, the root issue, I should say, was when, when the server, the only server at the time, went through the OBH fire in Strasbourg in March 2021. And shortly afterwards, we started the, the replication, uh, the, 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 design, the design for the replication protocol. You can tell the causality here. We used the fire as an opportunity to do that. Machines were and are still hard to provision. But well, that's for financial reasons because the project is uh, still unfunded. And it's hard to provide a commercial service 
to get a source of um, income to fund the projects. When uh, your machines are so small that uh, you can't provide a stable service for uh, many months or maybe may, uh, many years. Another smaller issue is that everything runs on NixOS, and unfortunately, uh, NixOS doesn't have a, a big, uh, as big a community as other tools like Kubernetes or Docker. That's a really sad because NixOS is a much superior tool, but that's that's life, I guess. Another issue is that, and that's the that's the one that motivated my uh, announcements of uh, the rewrites. Uh, we needed local geographical replicas of PostgreSQL plus a particular machine. Uh, so this is using leader election. That's what PostgreSQL supports. Uh, and so all the uh, mutable transactions go through a single leader, but the, the immutable transactions, the read-only transactions are uh, served from local geographical replicas. And because the machines are so small, they are under provisions. Often what happens is... Um, a machine is overloaded, and the other the, the other the other two machines detects detect that they they're not able they the uh, their their leader does not respond as fast as usual. So they, they, they detect that as a problem with the leader. They organize a new leader election, and they, and then they do a leader switchover. But because the leader was not actually down, but it was just um it was just in the load what happens there is that all the mutable mutable transactions that went through the leader the former leader maybe don't have the time to uh be synchronized to the, the followers before the, the before the switchover and this causes uh data loss sometimes and actually way too often another issue is that this is a single person effort uh, i've been working mostly alone on uh, on the nest the whole community is bigger than that. I, I want to take the, this opportunity to thank all the, the amazing contributors and, and testers we, we have. And uh, finally, I want to, uh, I'm not with you today, but I, I will still want to take uh, the opportunity of Bob 2023 to announce the new complete redesign of the Nest. It's now written in TypeScript plus some um, WebAssembly compiled from Rust running on top of Cloudflare workers for now, but we hope to extend it to other function as a service providers. It's uh, entirely open source and will be completely open source and uh, self-hosting will be uh, made possible. This new redesign doesn't run actual people repositories because it doesn't have any server or disk to run them on, but Instead, it runs uh, fake PHU repositories with Sanakiria running on top of Cloudflare KV or durable objects, uh, any, uh, any, any of them. This is because we want to be able to uh, handle channels and uh, forks. So this is how we do it. it. The design includes many small independent workers. The UI is written in Svelte. The, hopefully, the small independent workers will make it much easier to contribute to. The current, the current nest is a giant monolith, and it was always uh, hard to open source because it needs to run in a quite tricky infrastructure, and it's hard to uh, it's hard to 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 set up all the servers in order to uh, just uh, test it or or to uh, self-host. But the, this new design with many small independent workers, this is not a microservice architecture because each worker is responsible for the full full depth of a of a feature. So hopefully this will uh, make it much easier to uh, contribute to, and even for people who don't know much about category theory, version control, distributed systems, or any of that, uh, this will provide them with an opportunity to contribute to Pihu. Self-hosting will be possible. It's not yet easy because we'll still need uh, a cloud machine, a regular cloud machine, to do, to do some of the tasks that are not yet possible on uh, Cloudflare workers. We hope to lift that constraint really soon. All right, as a conclusion, a bit of a perspective. Open source and funding first. Uh, these two terms don't always go well together. Nobody's ever been working full-time on Pihul. And uh, when I was an academic researcher, I understood it as part of my mission to try and advance the state of the art in this area. But now this isn't the case anymore. I work in the energy sector 
helping people share electricity from their uh, local solar panels, not no relation with people. And so, yeah, so that's that's uh, one issue I believe many projects are facing at the moment. Uh, just like functional programming, radical changes like this, introducing mathematics into version control, take time to be adopted. That's not that's neither uh, positive nor negative. It's, it's just life. It's what uh, the Haskell community has been calling avoiding success at all costs. So we hope people won't avoid success, or, or, or rather, we hope that people, I hope that people will avoid success exactly in the same way that Haskell did. That is not at all. But uh, we have to acknowledge that things take time and, and we have to be patient. This project also gives us the ability to use version control and to bring version control to places where Git cannot possibly go. When I say Git, I mean the entire uh, class of uh, version control systems related to Git. Video games, for example, where artists uh, currently don't want to learn Git, and even if they did, uh, it would be hard for them to, to work with their large binary files. Legal documents are another application with all these uh, parliaments in the world running manual version control, version controls, uh, writing manual patches, they call them, they call, they call them amendments. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is also a, a big avenue. Parliaments, I'm aware that parliaments are uh, big bureaucratic institutions and don't work really fast, but that's also something that could be really cool. And an extension to that, uh, probably easier is participatory democracy. We are able to provide simple enough tools to be used by uh, uh, regular people without any special tra training. This would uh, be really cool. So I want to thank you all for your attention and apologize again. I couldn't be uh, here with you today. That would have been um, my first in-person conference since COVID-19 and visiting Berlin. I'm a big music fan, so visiting Berlin would have uh, has always been a big dream of mine. I do support the strikes in France that uh, caused the trains to not run to uh, Paris from my place and then to Berlin. But I'm also really sad that I couldn't uh, I, I couldn't meet the Bob community. There's a fantastic line of speakers this year. And so that's it. Thanks again. And now I'll take questions if there's time.